Now we have five elements in our circuit. We have three resistors and two capacitors. But we only have three constraints. We have omega naught, H naught, and Q naught. To satisfy these three constraints with five elements, we have an infinite number of possible selections. If one is a single solution, what we could do is pick two of the components and solve for the remaining three. Now the equation for Q naught was pretty complicated. In fact, all the equations are pretty complicated, but the ratio of omega naught to Q naught was just equal to this expression, which is a lot simpler. And so maybe this is a good place to start. Capacitors don't have as many values to select from as resistors, so why don't I pick these two capacitors to be equal to each other, to be a standard value that I have in my parts box. Then I could solve for R5, be equal to put that on this side of the equation. That would then bring this over here as, a, as Q naught over omega naught. And then I would have, here I'd have two of these, and then just let C4 equal C3, so I'd have two over C3. What I have is picking the resistor R5 depends on the filter specs of omega naught and Q naught divided by my first pick. Now, if it turns out that the first pick was resulting in R5 being impractical, we can go back and pick a new value for C3 and try it again. The next most complicated equation was for H0, and H0 was equal to 1 over R1 over R5 times the quantity 1 plus C4 over C3. So I'm going to put the H0 here and the R1 over here. Picked C3 to C B C4, so that's just equal to 1. I've got an equation for R5. It's actually equal to this, so it's 2Q0 divided by omega naught C3. A 2 and a 2 cancel here bring the Q naught in the numerator, and I've got Q naught divided by H naught omega naught C3. If R1 turns out to be impractical, I could pick a new value of C3. Given my three filter specifications, I'll learn how to pick these shortly, and my initial pick, I can then pick R1. I want to keep my resistors roughly between 1K and 1 meg ohm. If things are smaller than 1K, we tend to draw too much current. If they're above 1 meg, tend to have noise in our resistors, and that begins to degrade our audio signal. Now we have one more component left, that's R2, and take a look at solving for it. Take a look at the equation for omega naught squared. We have an R2 in there, so we could use that equation to solve for our last resistor, R2. Multiply this over here, and then bring the R1 on the other side of the equation, minus 1 over R1, and we've got the value of 1 over R2. Again, let's substitute in the value for our components that we've already solved for, and just try to get this selection in terms of our previous pick of C3. I've got omega naught squared, I've got C3 times C3, so C3 squared. R5 was equal to 2Q0 over omega naught C3 from the last page. And R1 was equal to Q naught divided by H naught omega naught C3. Got some terms canceling here, so I've got an omega naught squared and omega naught, so that cancels, gives me omega naught. 2Q naught, and then C3 squared and C3 just gives me a C3. And I just got this term over here. I can pull out a common omega naught C3, left with a 2Q naught, H naught divided by Q naught. R2 is going to be the reciprocal of this expression. R2 then is 1 over this. Multiply numerator and denominator by Q0. I get a Q0 here. Omega0 C3. 2 Q0 squared. And then the Q0 canceling. You can see that this resistor could possibly go negative. I've got another constraint to worry about. And that's the, the values of H0 and Q0. But this is implying that for a positive resistor, that 2 Q0 squared is greater than H0. Or we could set solve for this is that Q naught needs to be greater than H naught over 2 square root. So given the three filters design parameters, we can come up with a design procedure. But we have to just check that Q naught is greater than the square root of H naught over 2. But if it isn't, we have to go back and do a different design procedure. In other words, we wouldn't pick C3 to equal C4. And there's an infinite number of procedures. You just simply have one here that's fairly simple and using two capacitors that are equal to each other. We'll do that. We'll pick standard value that's in our parts box, and then our values of R5, R1, and R2 are a consequence then of our equations, and our values of H0, Q0, and omega naught, and our initial pick of C3. And just reiterating what we had above here is that if you do get an impractical result, just pick a different C3. If this isn't true, then you have to actually do a different design procedure. Maybe you gotta pick C3 to be twice C4. You have to play with that to find the right combination. In chapter 13 of ECE 202, we learned that any periodic waveform can be written as an infinite sum of sine waves through a thing called the Fourier series. What I want to do in this lab is to take a square wave and actually pull a sine wave out of it. it. Turns out it's quite easy to generate a square wave in electronics, and we'll see an example of this in ECE 303 lab. But I grabbed the expression for the Fourier series for this particular wave shape, and it's the following. It's equal to 4v maximum over pi, where this is the v maximum value, the summation from n equals 1 to infinity, of 1 over n times the sine of 2 pi n f times t. Here n is equal to an odd number, in other words 1, 3, 5, 7, and so on. Suppose they have a 2 volt square wave at 100 hertz. 
Well, then evaluating this equation for n equals 1, I'm going to have 4 times 2, which is 8, divided by pi, 1 over 1, and the sine of 2 pi 1 times 100 times t. The next term is when n is equal to 3, so we'll get 4v maximum. 4 times 2 is 8, divided by pi, and then divided by 3, and then the sine of 2 pi 3 times 100 times t, and so on with the 5 and 500 and 7 and 700 and so on. What you see in this expression is here I've got this sine wave at 100 hertz, but the one at 300 hertz is a third as big, a fifth as big, a seventh as big. As we take our other harmonic terms, they're smaller in value and keep getting smaller. So although we, technically we need to have an infinite number of sine waves to produce a square wave, but in reality we don't need an infinite number, but just a lot of them. So in our design, what we like to do is to recover a sine wave from a square wave, this particular two volt square wave. And to do this, we need to eliminate the 300, 500, 700, 900 hertz sinusoidal components that are in our square wave. Now a filter can't really eliminate a particular signal, but it can make it a lot smaller. So let's use the idea of attenuation to get rid of these terms that we just have the fundamental frequency at 100 hertz. So back to our equation on page one for the magnitude of the transfer function for the bandpass filter was equal to this. Now we're operating at a frequency that's greater than omega naught, and our value of q naught is generally a number greater than one. If that's the case, what I've got here is an omega naught minus omega squared, but we're saying that omega is bigger than this. Difference will be dominated by this term, and we're going to square it in square so you get the fourth power. Now this term here just has an omega squared in it with an omega naught over q naught, but omega naught is smaller than omega, so this term here would be smaller than having just omega to the fourth power because I've got an omega squared and omega naught squared. You can roughly approximate this denominator as just this term right here, minus omega squared, squared, square root. The squaring and the square root, get rid of the minus sign, just have an omega squared, and then I've got an h naught, omega naught, divided by q naught. I have an omega, and then I have an omega squared. That's going to cancel. It's left with an omega. So this is roughly the value of my gain at a frequency greater than omega naught. If omega were equal to 3 omega naught, it's going to put in a 3 omega naught here. The omega naughts cancel, and I get h naught divided by 3 times q naught. So this is the value of my gain for the frequency of 300 hertz. And so my gain at 300 hertz is h naught over 3 q naught. And I want this 300 hertz signal to be attenuated. So let me make this number big enough relative to the value we had at the center frequency, which is just equal to h naught. If I make this denominator 30, in other words, make q naught equal to 10, then I'm the gain at this frequency is 1 30th of what it was at the center frequency, and my third harmonic is smaller than the fundamental, so I will get some attenuation. Now, is this enough? Well, we'll have to see whether it works or not, if we can get out a pretty clean sine wave out of our square wave. So I'm going to pick the value of q naught. Now, suppose that I want from this 2 volt square wave a 10 volt sine wave. So my, my scale factor with the fundamental frequency was 8 over pi, which is 2.546. So for a 2 volt square wave, I'm going to get out a 2.546 peak sine wave. I need to multiply this by some number to get 10. That's my gain of H0 at the center frequency. That means that H0 is about 4. I've got F0, which is the frequency of my square wave. I've got Q0 of 10 and an H0 of 4. So these are my parameters for my filter. Let's check that. This inequality is satisfied, so I've got a q naught of 10, h naught was equal to 4, so this is equal to 1.414, and of course 10 is greater than that, so our procedure will work. We don't have any negative resistors. Pick C3 equal to C4, I'll, I'll pick a 0.047 microfarad capacitor that's in our parts box. I'll solve for R5, which is 2 times q naught, which is 10, omega naught is 2 pi times 100, and C3 is 47 nanofarads. And that's 677.255k. R1 is going to be equal to 10 divided by h naught, which is 4, 2 pi times 147 nanofarads, and that's 84.657k. And lastly, R2 is 10 divided by 2 times 10 squared minus 4 times 2 pi 100 times 47 nanofarads. That's 1.728k. Now these are not standard resistor values, and the nearest standard resistor values are 680k, 82k, and 1.8k. Next, I'd like to show you a technique for measuring phase using what's called a Lissajou pattern method. Now, in our circuit, we have input and output voltages that have different amplitudes and different phase angles. But one thing they have in common is the same frequency. If that's the case, it's possible to actually measure phase relationships and actually frequencies by plotting one voltage versus another. Suppose I have a, a sine wave uh, times an amplitude of C and a frequency of omega, and I'll call that X. 
and that y is a different amplitude and a different phase angle. Now if I were to plot y versus x, I get different types of shapes that look like ellipses. And if you take the ratio of this value to this value as the arc sine, you can get the angle if it's between 0 and 90 degrees for this value of theta. Likewise here, if you had b and a, 180 minus the arc sine of a over b gives you the phase angle if it's between 90 and 180. Now in the oscilloscope, we actually can disable the time base and put a voltage there. Now the theory for all this is quite complicated, and I'll leave that as an outside exercise if you're interested. What we're going to do is just take a look at a very special case. Shown right here. If the phase angle is 180, you wind up getting this ellipse just becoming a straight line. What's interesting, if you had a phase angle of 90 degrees and B and C were equal, you get a circle. And if you had a phase angle of zero, that straight line would be passing through the origin but in the first and third quadrant. What we're going to do is we tune our circuit, and as we pass through our center frequency, we'll see the relationship passing through a straight line. Let's try to prove this. I thought I'd just run some spice simulation to show you that it works with just some known values of sine waves and phase shifts. Let me zoom on this so you can see it a little bit better. So here's my spice file. What I'm generating is a sine wave with a difference of 45 degrees in angle and also two different amplitudes, an amplitude of one and two, and you can see the relationships down here. But when I plot one versus another, I get this in ellipse, and I get the my intercept here is about 2, and my intercept here is 1.414. So if we take the arc sine of that ratio of A to B, we end up getting 45 degrees. This next picture to the right is the same file. I just changed the angle to be 90 degrees. If these two amplitudes were identical, I'd get a perfect circle. So you get some interesting shapes on the screen by plotting one sine wave versus another of the same frequency. On the bottom left, I changed the phase angle to 180. As you can see down here, and I get a, a line that passes through the origin between the second and fourth quadrant. We're going to use this particular shape to find the tuning of our circuit to see where the actual center frequency is. So it's possible to actually measure phase angle with this technique, although we're going to use a different idea in lab. And I'll, I'll introduce this in ECE 303. What's interesting also is if you take two different frequency sine waves and plot one versus the other, you get a variety of different shapes. And depending on the relationship between the two frequencies, you get different types of configurations, and you could actually figure out a table of different types of pictures that would tell you relationships between frequencies between two sine waves. Now we have a computing capability in our oscilloscope, and so we can actually calculate and measure frequency quite easily, but this is a technique that was used before the instruments we have today. Yeah, this is a very old technique, but sometimes when you're doing a research problem, having ideas from the past can sometimes give you some insight into solving current problems. So it's always interesting to learn ideas that were used extensively in the past, but not particularly now for what we're doing in the same application. But things can change in the future, and just having that wealth of experience can help you design all kinds of things. Let me go back to our full screen again. When designing active filters with QNOTs around 10 or more, the non-ideal capacitor can sometimes wreak havoc in the filter performance. Let's go back to our discussion of an ideal capacitor we did in ECE202, where the angle between the voltage and current is 90 degrees. Here's our voltage across our capacitor and the current going through it. Again, these are phasors, and the current leads the voltage by 90 degrees. Now for a real capacitor, the angle between voltage and current is actually less than 90 degrees. A measure of this non-ideal effect is called the dissipation factor, and it's defined as following. The dissipation factor, we'll call D, is the tangent of 90 degrees minus phi, where phi is the angle between voltage and current. This is measured at a specific frequency, and omega is equal to 2 pi f. If the angle between voltage and current is less than 90 degrees, we could model that with a real part added to our imaginary part. We could do that with a series or parallel element. Let's do a series element. I'll call it R sub s in series with C sub s. Let's find the impedance of this. That would be R sub s plus 1 over j omega C sub s. Let's take the reciprocal of that, and we'll call that y of s. And multiply numerator and denominator by j omega C sub s, the j omega C sub s in the numerator, a j omega c sub s r sub s plus 1. Let's put this in polar form. So the magnitude and the angle of y of s is equal to the magnitude of the numerator, which is just omega c sub s, angle will be 90 degrees, divided by the magnitude and angle of the denominator, which is going to be the square root of the sum of the squares, 1 squared plus omega c sub s r sub s squared square root, and then the arc tangent for the angle of the imaginary part divided by the real part. The angle phi is the angle of the numerator minus the angle of the denominator. And here we've got the value of 90 degrees and phi, so let's see if we can solve for that combination together. So I'll bring the phi on this side of the equation, bring the arc tangent on this side of the equation, 
and then take the tangent of both sides of the equation. The tangent of the arc tangent is just the argument, and then we have the tangent of 90 degrees minus phi. And again, this is called our dissipation factor D. Now when you purchase a capacitor, they usually refer to what's called the element Q, and this is just the reciprocal of D. We could then solve for R sub S in this equation. R sub S would then be equal to D divided by omega C sub S, or you could replace D with 1 over D as Q. Now the Q of the element is not the Q naught of the circuit. Very confusing, the letter Q is used quite a bit in electronics and in circuits, but in this particular case it's referring to the losses in the capacitor due to the dielectric. And we're modeling this as an effective series resistance. What effect does the element Q of the capacitor have on our active filter? Well, in this lab we designed an active filter using two ideal capacitors, we call them C3 and C4. Then we solve for the transfer function, which was equal to minus H naught omega naught over Q naught times S, divided by S squared plus S times omega naught over Q naught plus omega naught squared. And this is the form of a second order bandpass filter. Now we're saying that the real capacitor looks like an ideal capacitor in series with an ideal resistance. Let's substitute that in for each of the two capacitors that we have in our filter. C3 is replaced by an ideal capacitor and an ideal resistor, and likewise C4. And this will mimic the effect of the non-ideal capacitor. Now we still have two capacitors in our circuit, so if we resolve our equations, this would be a little tedious, but we would find that we also have a second order denominator, which is some S squared plus S times a new factor, omega naught over Q naught, but I'm going to put a hat over each of these to indicate that they may not be the same values we had before, and then plus some omega naught hat squared. The numerator will come out very close in form to just being a S to the 1 term, and again, we'll have some H naught omega naught over Q naught. We suddenly shifted from what we had with the ideal capacitors. So in lab, I'm going to have you use two different capacitors on the same circuit. One we're going to use are the polyester film capacitors, which have high element Qs, and they'll have a minor effect on the overall filter performance. In other words, the new values of H naught omega naught over Q naught will be slightly shifted from what we calculated with ideal capacitors. We'll then put a ceramic capacitor in place of the polyester film capacitor, and this has a lower value of element Q, and it'll have a bigger effect on H naught, omega naught, and Q naught. Picking the right capacitor for an application is very important. The purpose of this lab was to take a look at active filters. These are used extensively in audio preamplifier circuits, as well as test instruments. Active filters consist of resistors, capacitors, and some form of amplification. In our case, we used an op-amp. And these can realize filter functions similar to RLC circuits. What we'll see in chapter 15 of ECE202 is that inductors have another effect called mutual inductance, and this can electrically couple one inductor to another, and this can cause problems in certain types of filter circuits. The concepts we covered in the lab lecture in the lab itself are multiple loop feedback filters, we developed a design procedure for component selection, we talked about using a Fourier series to model a periodic waveform, and lastly we looked at the effects of capacitor quality factor on filter response. In the laboratory, we'll take a look at using the XY feature of the scope to display a Lissajous pattern for tuning. We'll also measure the quality factor of a capacitor using an LCR meter. When you come to lab, there'll be a quiz that covers the background notes and this video, as well as the lab procedure itself. Now, when you come to lab the next time, your TA will return your graded lab, and we have an additional exercise. This is at the end of the lab. We're going to ask you to recreate your lab results on SPICE. So you'll do lab this next time. When you come back the following time, you'll get your lab report back. We'll then do this exercise, and it'll be due the next time that you come to lab. And this is lab 7, active bandpass filter.